you have to be the right person. You have to be the person that is at least modeling the things you want to receive. Mm -hmm. But the other half of that is you've got to be with the right person. So, uh, and sometimes people just aren't compatible. People want yeah. different things. People are comfortable with different levels of growth or intimacy or, or that. Hi, Corey. Welcome to A Word to the Wise. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing today? Wonderful. Thank you. So I want to know how you became a love and relationship coach. Well, it was a an evolution. I started off, you know, if I back all the way up to grade school, high school, I was way too shy to even consider talking to a girl. So I was the nerdy guy in the back who was just quiet and writing in his writing in his notebook or whatever. Uh, so as life went on, I wondered why life wasn't responding so awesomely uh, since I was such a good person. And through various uh, stumbles and challenges, eventually uh, the upshot is that I hired a love coach of my own to help me traverse some territory that he'd already been through. And mm -hmm. uh, between that and uh, learning from David Data about what it really means to be a man and to stand in my integrity and, you know, own my voice and all that. So, uh, and I eventually um, was being asked by couples mostly to help them have a better experience of lovemaking. And so I got a lot of fulfillment from that. That was very nice. And, but it really morphed into uh, helping just everyone who either maybe they want to prepare themselves to meet someone special or they want to make their relationship better. Oftentimes married couples, or married persons, they come to me and say, there's been a long intimacy drought. How do we return to love? And so th those mm -hmm. are the kind of things that I really enjoy helping people with. Yeah, I'm very curious about what you said about how you felt life was not responding to you with how you were living life as a good person. Are you talking in the realms of relationships and manifesting love into your life? Were you talking about that or was that in general? In general, but also mm -hmm. the love romance part of that is was more stark and more... Uh, obvious that it wasn't really working out so well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I appreciate you. Thank you for sharing that. So what inspired you to write your new book, um, Soul Statements, A Love Coach's Guide to Successful Communication? Sure. Well, it's just what I call soul statements is just something I developed over time. And I found myself coaching so many people with that. And they were getting such great shifts and movement and success from, from being more centered and connected to their values that I thought, oh, I should write about this and immediately thought of a blog because I already had a blog with a couple dozen articles. And when I started putting pen to paper, I realized it was much more than a blog. So that's the genesis. So how would you describe soul statements in comparison to affirmations or mantras? Are they the same thing or are they different? They might be the same in a real general sense of a, a big set of, but they differ pretty drastically in that a, an affirmation is emotionally putting yourself into a desired state. And so you're, you're trying to attract the future towards you or draw yourself into a, a happy future. And there's nothing wrong with that. What I found helpful 
in the moments when we forget our own worth or our own lovableness, there's something we say to ourselves in that moment. So there's, there's whatever happened in life and then there's what we make it mean. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, if we're talking negatively toward ourselves, then that's what's being reinforced. And so, but what's right about you, about me, about each one of us is always available if we want to focus on that. And so a soul statement is a, is a declaration that reminds you who you are at your depth, at your soul, at your core, and what it's who you are and how good you are. And it's true and it's always going to be true. So you could say, I have a strong heart. That's true. And so you don't have to draw that t to you. It's just who you are. And if we can remember the more powerful parts of ourselves, the good parts in these moments of doubt and distraction and distress, then we can anchor to that and act more powerfully with more presence and we can more easily stand up, use our voice to uh, stand up for our values and what we value. Yes. So saying I have a good heart, would that be an example of a soul statement? Yeah. Yeah. Or my heart is a trusted guide or I have grit inside me or I'm stronger than my challenges. Mm. So those, or another one I like is my distress is not a forever condition. Mm, I love that. <laughs> so it sounds like soul statements are more of speaking to that inherent worthiness and value and strength in all of us that we need to be reminded of, not kind of convinced of. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We're not in the convincing business. Yes. We're in the remembering who and what and why we are business. Yes, I agree. So in your work with couples and also I'm assuming you work with a lot of single people who are also searching for love. What I've noticed as a trend is that a lot of people are looking for love, but they're also struggling with vulnerability and keeping their heart open. How do you work with couples and single people to keep their heart open and not be afraid to be vulnerable and receive and also give love. Yeah, that's a really big thing for, for many, many people. And basically it comes down to a willingness to be uncomfortable in those moments where you want to stand up for your own heart in the interest of protecting your heart, or maybe you've just felt a contraction or a little uh, emotional ouch. And y you need to be able to trust that you'll use your voice to protect your heart in those moments. And so we can go into a lot more situations when we're secure in the knowledge that, hey, you know, if something comes up, I'm going to speak up for myself. I'm going to not abandon my heart anymore. And, and all will be, I trust that all will be well because I'm going to act as a resourced adult. Yeah. And do you find that that allows people to also not be so bitter in their love journey? Cause I think when your heart has been, hurt a couple of times, you, we all tend to feel a little bit bitter and we do want love and we do feel worthy of love. But then at the same time, we start, start to feel scorned and we might act in retaliation because of the disappointments or rejections that we're receiving in keeping our heart open while looking for love. Yeah. And it's a really beautiful and I think useful practice to spend some quiet time talking to your heart, becoming intimate with your own heart and intimate meaning you have a close, trusting, open relationship. 
So yeah. that might involve making apo apologies, saying, you know, I know these things happened and I am so sorry that I didn't speak up for you at those times. And, and so, you know, there's an apology, there's maybe some amends, there's sitting in compassion, trying to fill yourself with just as much compassion and empathy and appreciation as you can possibly hold and let that just so let your heart soak in that. And so from moving on from there, you can also then make a commitment, like a vow to your heart. You can even write that on a piece of paper and fold it up and put it on a special spot in your in your home saying, you know, I vow to be with you, to cherish you, to love you, to speak up for you, and to protect you forever. That's it. It's you and me, babe. I love that, just speaking to your heart and reassuring your heart, because I think a lot of us, we want that reassurance from the outside world, and a lot of times we're not going to receive that, so we have to build that intimate relationship and really talk to our heart in order to keep it resilient because life isn't always going to give you what you want. And sometimes, yeah, you are going to face rejection or just feel like things aren't working out the way you want them to work out, especially in love, because I know a lot of people feel that way. Mm -hmm. So another thing that's very important in relationships, and it's something that I'm very passionate about because I think it's a huge foundation when it comes to the longevity of a relationship, and that is communication which is also something that your book is about. So why do you think a lot of people struggle with communication in all facets of life, but most specifically within romantic relationships? Because we're, a lot of it comes down to a fear of loss. Well, if I speak up, maybe it would diminish the goodwill that I'm feeling right now, we've built some some wonderful feelings, I don't want that to go back the other direction. Mm -hmm. And, and what we find is that when we do speak up in these moments and say, you know, I have a value for um, consistency. And there's this, you know, back here with what just happened, my value for consistency wasn't being met. And so it starts a conversation. And if that isn't received well, that's good information <laughs> that either you need to change how you present things or you may get curious about the other person, why they have such a response to that. And maybe it can get worked out, maybe maybe not, but it's it's also need to know information if you're going to create something really sustainable, you need to know how this other person wants to be spoken to in terms of feeling respected and, and also listened to. And you need to know um, that in the end, they will remain open to hearing what's important to you as well. And so that's, You've got to get past these, uh, this awkwardness and this uh, hesitancy to say, you know what, my heart is valuable and I'm going to honor that relationship before I extend out to these, to these others. But my heart comes first. Yes, I agree with you. I think we suffer more in relationships when we don't communicate our needs and our truths. But I also know that it takes two to tango. So if someone is an excellent communicator, another person in a relationship is not always an excellent communicator. And you can speak your truth, but at what point do you say like, okay, I've communicated my truth. I've communicated my needs, listen to my heart, and this person is not receiving it. So do I keep working towards it? Or do I realize that 
this is not a good match. Sure. Well, you have to be the right person. You have to be the person that is at least modeling the things you want to receive. Mm -hmm. But the other half of that is you've got to be with the right person. So, uh, and sometimes people just aren't compatible. People want yeah. different things. People are comfortable with different levels of growth or intimacy or, or that. So yeah, you have to be the right person and be with the right person. Yes, that's the key. There's something else you mentioned in your book and you say for better communication, talk less and listen more. So do you believe that another key to becoming a better communicator is listening more? I know I hear that a lot, that a lot of times we don't really listen to understand. We're mm -hmm. just trying to respond and speak our mind, but we're not really taking in what the other person is saying. So can you speak to why listening more enhances better communication? Yes, Jimmy. So by, by listening more, and being more present when you listen, there's a higher chance that this other person will feel listened to and heard. And wow, I got to say what was on my mind and in my, hopefully in my heart. And at some point, we hope that that translates into them feeling like they got whatever point they were trying to make across that now they're ready to listen to you and um, listening. It's also how, a, how anybody else responds to a given thing is not going to be typically the way I would respond to that same thing because I didn't grow up in their family. I didn't, grew up with their gender, perhaps, or their challenges, their body, their school, their neighborhood, their friends. I didn't have the same inputs and, and everything as they. So, of course, we would naturally respond differently here and there. Uh, and so that's part of what's valuable about becoming curious. And I know that when I'm grumpy, it's because I'm thinking about me and what I'm not experiencing that I want to experience or what I'm experiencing that I don't want to experience. And so if I can remember, oh, perhaps I'm not the most important person in the room, maybe these other people have beautiful motivations. And if I can get curious and acknowledge, oh, I, they're, they're trying to do this or do that, maybe not the way I would, but I can appreciate the, the feeling, the desire that they have for, for, for being heard, for being secure, for whatever it may be. And so just being humble, remembering that my personal issues aren't any greater than anyone else's and um, that just allows for for doing something other than having a contest to say who's been most hurt. I find that when you listen, you know, without trying to respond, you kind of take yourself out of the conversation for a little bit and almost listen as if you were a third party. It really allows you to enter the world of the other person that you are speaking to or trying to communicate with. Because like you said, we all have a different background. We all have things that trigger us. We all have different ways of interpreting the same situation. So, you know, something that might not be a big deal to us, or it might be more significant to them. We might not be able to fully understand it, but if we listen and remove our ego from it, I think we're really able to immerse ourselves in that other person's world and fully understand them. So that was good. Thank you, Corey. Yes, very good. Another thing you, you say in your book is that a shouting contest of who has been most wronged is counterproductive at best. 
begin with a willingness to accept the impact of your words and actions versus arguing for the validity of your own experience, which is a very, very powerful quote because everyone just wants to prove their point and prove that they're correct. So what would you say the best methods are in terms of communicating when someone is arguing with their partner? Well, I would try a couple different things. One, I would try some active listening. So that might sound like, so what I'm, what I'm hearing you saying is that you're upset because the garbage hasn't been taken out yet is you know and they're like well yeah blah blah i'm like well is there anything else or you know i try to really get them to identify so that yeah that's the thing then they can hopefully realize well i've actually just said that like 10 times and here is this other person saying it like this i just what you're saying is important to me And I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. What's getting you upset is, or what's made you upset is this. And am I close? And so you can kind of help them get to the kernel or the the main thing that's causing their distress and then say, okay, if if there's an apology is appropriate, you can say, I hear that that really affected you and I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, If it's, if you're not sure what might be appropriate, you can say, all right, I get that this is a big problem for you. What do you imagine will help you now? Mm -hmm. Or what would, what would make, what would help this now? Or what, what can we do right now to, to help, to, I don't, I don't like to say fix it, but, you know, so I say, just what do you imagine will make you feel better? Yeah. How can, how can, do you have any ideas for resolution? <laughs> so trying to, once we've identified it, there's no sense going round and round because we got the thing. Now let's, it, you can say, well, is there anything else you want to say about this? Or do you feel heard? Do you feel like we've really gotten it? And if they're, yeah, okay, well, let's figure out what to do about it now. What do you imagine would help you? Mm. Yeah, no, that's really good. I think, like you said, once you identify what the issue is and kind of call it out and show that you understand what the issue is, it's like, okay, how do we now move forward? Because people do struggle with apologizing. Uh, there's a lot of ego in the relationship. So it seems like what you're talking about really is just kind of taking your ego out of it and working to understand your partner and not just understand your partner, but working to make sure that their needs or complaints are understood, taken into account, and then the necessary changes are made. Exactly so. And the thing is, if, if say they're they're saying um, that part of their upset you don't agree with, mm-hmm. you you've heard that this is what this is what they've said is upsetting them. You've determined, you know, is there anything else? Is this the whole thing? Do I understand this? Yeah, okay, that's it. And you're just not agreeing with their version of reality. You you don't have to admit to what you're being accused of if it's not accurate uh, or you just feel like it's wacky that does that doesn't or preclude you though from acknowledging acknowledging that this person is upset for whatever the reasons they're upset so um acknowledging is it admitting it's just saying i get that this is really distressing for you i get that this is a big deal i see that this has really affected you 
that's acknowledgement. Yes. And just again, just a disclaimer, this is in a situation where you were with uh, the right person, because there are some people who take advantage of certain situations and one person's more empathetic, one, one person is more willing to listen and the other person is the one with all of the complaints. And you could easily find yourself in a situation where the person who's more empathetic and willing to communicate is always listening and always being understanding, but it's becoming more of a toxic relationship. So this would, so what we're talking about is more of a healthy relationship, healthy communication in a relationship that's more or less solid, right? Where both people are willing to work through things. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, something else that you say that is very powerful is, um, intent matters less than impact. And I actually used to think that intention and impact had to be taken into account almost like 50-50, whereas you have to look at the person's intent behind their action. Was it coming from a malicious place? But also the person who had the impact on you has to also recognize the impact it had on you, even though their intention was mm -hmm. good. But mm -hmm. I do like what you say say here, which is intent matters less than impact. Can you speak to that a little bit more, why you're giving um, impact more weight than intention? Yeah, well, I can have the most well-meaning motivations and if i speak in a way that uh causes someone to feel badly my i didn't mean to necessarily uh cause any kind of hurt nevertheless my actions did and so if we'll just say even if you're just say a college professor giving a lecture and you're you're saying all this great stuff and the students totally misread or misunderstand what you're saying, what you, what you meant to say didn't matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is what they understood from what you said. And th the same with intimate relationships. And so it doesn't matter if I didn't mean anything by my angry tone. My angry tone cause cause someone to to feel something they didn't want to feel and so it matters more the impact the effect i've had on another person more than oh what i was thinking or not thinking or anything like that yeah yeah which is yeah. a good point oh, oh and let me say that jumi when someone say an intimate partner would come to me and say you had a terrible tone and I so don't appreciate it and da 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 da, da and going on S you this and you that you're a dummy dog and you should have and you shouldn't have I'm less able to really hear that and search for a compassionate empath empathetic response than if they were to say, oh, you know, the tone you just used felt like felt like a weight on my heart. And I'm guessing that you didn't really mean mean it that way. I just want to let you know that this didn't feel good. Would you be willing to speak differently? I'm way more interested in accommodating that person's needs when they're skipping the blame and skipping the evaluation and skipping the name calling and just say, this didn't feel good. Could we do it differently? Okay, sure. Yes, that's, that's good. And it's a good point that you're making here because I struggle with the balance of, obviously you want to speak from a place of love when you're talking to someone that you love whether in a romantic relationship, in a friendship, or in a family dynamic. But at the same time, 
being too politically correct or being too overly polite as well might not be your true and authentic expression, right? So something else you say in your book is that over politeness equals death in intimate relationships. If you want to be better, if you want to get better, you must face difficult emotions and embrace awkward conversations. And I think sometimes, you know, we want to speak our truth. We want to communicate our needs and how we're feeling. But as we talked about earlier, it's just that people have different ways of filtering words and tones based on their own personal experience. So one, I, I do want you to speak to that quote about over politeness. And then also how do we balance, you know, speaking from a place of love so that we're not having a negative impact with our words, but also being true to ourselves and not being overly polite to a place where we're not really speaking our truth. Yeah. Yeah, Jimmy. Messy and real for me is preferable to polite and putting on a mask. And so ideally, if we're with an intimate, chosen, beloved, deep relationship with someone that doesn't have to mean forever, forever is not appropriate for all people, but, but deep nevertheless, then I'm interested in this person. I'm interested in what moves them and what moves them up and what moves them down. And I'm just interested in them. I care. And so there's, there's certain allowances for messiness or not doing it perfectly every time because partly because I know this person is trying. They're 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 not necessarily thinking, oh, I'm gonna make Corey feel poorly in some way just by how can I say this in a way that comes out terribly? <laughs> and so there's there's that kind of allowance. And but one of the things that we desire from an intimate relationship is is presence. We want to this we want ideally to be present for this moment to experience life with this person. And we hope that this other person is desiring the same and and um, and sometimes we just we're feeling however we're feeling and it just might look messy and and so that's where it's okay that we can handle that because we know the next thing is to uh, is to just speak speak up as we need to it doesn't mean we're we're going to um, be too overly particular with another person about, well, that wasn't perfect. Let's redo it. And it's like, yeah, no, it doesn't have to be so deep and serious all the time. Um, but when, but we want to ideally be as present as possible for our life. And that includes our intimate partner. Yeah, I agree. I think you said something, which is uh, something about perfection and I think in everything that we're talking about, there isn't such a thing as perfect communication. I think these are just tools to get us to as close to perfect communication as possible when it comes to romantic relationships. And yeah, sometimes it is going to be a little bit messy because you have to speak your truth. But I think there's a fine line between speaking your truth and also devaluing or insulting someone and not coming from a place of love. So I do think it's possible to speak your truth and also still hold space, a space for love when delivering that. Now we can't always account for how people are going to receive it. 
because I know that from personal experience, even if you come from a place of love, sometimes the impact can be hurtful. Like if you're getting to know someone, for example, and you realize that it's no longer aligned, even if you communicate that from a place of love, the impact on the person receiving that information is still going to be hurt and disappointment. Um, and we can't always avoid that, but it's, it's part of the process, you know? Indeed. And think of how differently it sounds by saying, I just need to be alone right now as somebody walks into the room or, Hey, I really love you and I need to be alone right now. So yes. you're leading with what's true and what's good, much like a soul statement for mm -hmm. yourself. It's like a soul statement for the togetherness. Like what's really true is, and what I'm capable maybe is something different. I love that. So or lead what, with what something. I'm capable of in the moment. Yes. Yeah. I love that. So lead with something good and true. Again, reemphasizing the soul statements. Like I really love you, appreciate you but I need some alone time. I like that. I like that. That's a very good way of making sure that the love is in that statement before delivering your truth, which it's not to cushion anyone, but it's just coming from a place of honoring the relationship and just making sure that the person you're communicating with doesn't internalize it as it's like, it's them or something, or it's, you're just being sensitive sure. to the other person, which is something that I appreciate. So I really love that. Lead with something true and then, you know, speaking your truth as well. Right. So you, rather than saying, hey, don't talk to me right now, you <laughs> might say, hey, I, I'm so into you and I've got to focus. So let's meet up later. <laughs> Yeah. And a lot of people don't do that. And it's so simple. It sounds so simple, but it's actually a lot harder in practice, right? Because you, that was a great example. And I think in the dating world, when you're getting to know someone and people have lives, when people are busy, they just tend to fall off, right? So you're left wondering, does this person really like me? Are they into me? And just saying that, hey, I'm really into you, actually, let's can we push this interaction to another time is mm -hmm. really powerful. And I think will help the longevity of the relationship if it were to pro progress forward. But yes, I, I think communication is um, a, a great foundation for any long-term relationship, no matter how long it lasts, just to, mm -hmm. if you were, if you're trying to preserve any sort of love or friendship, even after you guys, consciously uncouple if that was the situation I think communication is is a huge huge part um of every single relationship so thank you Corey so much for sharing all of your wonderful insights your book is awesome um this has been a great conversation and I always ask for final words of wisdom to the listeners it could be about everything we've been talking about or some other tip or gem that you keep in your back pocket as you go through life Thank you, Jimmy. I've enjoyed speaking with you. And the thought I would like to leave everyone with is that what we tell ourselves on the inside matters. The answers are in your center and you can learn to call up the best part of you in a moment. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Corey. Mm -hmm.